Soon you're going to get a chance to visit the Scholastic Book Fair at your school. You're going to find action, adventure, animals, aliens, awesome characters. And some books that may just surprise you, that may help you... Wow, okay, this is wild. We are officially on to episode 10. Isn't that crazy? So perfect timing here because no way would I have been able to do this if we were still on an odd episode number, but I'm actually going to visit my family for the next two weeks. So we're not skipping over anything, but episode 11 will be coming out on the 6th of July instead of next Wednesday. Sorry, guys. I do the episodes pretty much 100% on my own, and it usually takes me the entire week to plan out, record, edit, and assemble everything. So while I'm away, it might be a little tough to do it then. But come July 6, bam, episode 11 will be right there waiting for you. Anyways, getting back into the good stuff, last week we finally capped off the introduction of all of the deities, finishing off with the five gods of Olympus. Ares, Apollo, Dionysus, Hephaestus, and Hermes. And then of course we went over the rest of the 14 Olympians the weeks before that. But enough with all these pleasantries, this week is about a book. I bought my copy of Terry Deary's Twisted Tales Greek Legends in probably 2005, maybe 2006, but probably 2005, at my elementary school's annual Scholastic Book Fair when it came to town that year. So watch for them. I think when I bought the book, I finished off the order with a holographic bookmark and then a poster of puppies or something. And I still have my OG and to my own horror, almost 20 year old copy, but I have treasured it ever since. This is what the book is supposed to look like. And this is the current condition of mine. I have been reading it from time to time ever since I had it, but I used to read it like all the time when I was a kid, until of course I found out about the Percy Jackson series and that is its own can of worms. Terry Deary, the author, is a British author who has over 200 children's books, mostly focusing on history, but there's like so many of them and so many different topics. The Twisted Tale series is actually shared between him and other British authors, Margaret Simpson, funny, yes, and Michael Cox, also funny. But from the three of them, they also cover the Irish and Arthurian legends, horror stories, ghost stories, and Shakespearean stories. Of course, it is watered down to some degree, but I mean, there is a little picture of Orpheus's decapitated head floating down a river after the wild women rip him apart. So there is still some grit. And I only noticed like a year ago that the guy was British. Like the writing is so obviously very British. And now whenever I do read it, I'm hearing it in my head with a British accent, which now seems super odd. But I mean, the signs were always there. The term fancy and mate are sprinkled all throughout the book. I just didn't put it together until I was reading a bit out loud to my boyfriend and he pointed it out. So the book covers 10 of the most popular ancient Greek myths with some additional tidbits added in throughout, but it's still split up into 10 chapters. Zeus, Aphrodite, Orpheus and Eurydice, Perseus and Medusa, Theseus and the Minotaur, Oedipus, the labors of Hercules, Jason and the Argonauts, the Odyssey, and then finally the Trojan War. So the first chapter, Zeus, starts off with a story called Hera's Tale, and it's being narrated by Hera to us. And in the story, she's telling us pretty much the sum of her relationship with her brother husband. It starts off with almost the beginning when Cronus and Rhea are having all of their children and Cronus keeps eating them. But she breezes past that part pretty quick and moves on to her current relationship. And to paint out a picture of his unfaithfulness, she tells the story between Zeus and Princess Io, the one that got turned into the cow. In these twisted tales, Zeus is the one that turns his date into the cow to hide her from his wife who was originally told that he would be away fishing all day. So of course, then the story goes on that Argus was sent to keep an eye, or a hundred eyes, on the cow princess, and he was then promptly murdered by Hermes, and then Hera saved his eyes by popping them onto the tail of the peacock bird. 
After that, and still on the topic of Zeus, the next section is called Zeus's victims. These are all the gals that Zeus got with, consensually or not, but being a children's book, there is really no mention of anything too heinous. It's kept very light on this subject. There is a little report on each of these lovely ladies that goes over who she is, where she's from, what she looked like, what went down between her and Zeus, what you should say to her, what you definitely should not say to her, and a little comment about The Bachelorette. This one is for Leda, the queen of Sparta and mother of Helen. You know Helen, the one who the whole Trojan War was fought over? So, name, Leda. Address, Sparta, in Greece. Appearance, beautiful queen of Sparta. Report, Zeus fell in love with Leda when he saw her bathing in the river. He didn't want to appear as a man and scare her, so he appeared as a swan. As a result, Leda laid a couple of eggs. A daughter, Helen, grew from one of them. She became the most beautiful woman in the world, and the Greeks and Trojans fought the Trojan War over her. You should say to her, Helen takes after her mother. You should not say to her, fancy some scrambled eggs. Overall comment, will suit someone who likes to swan around. You may notice that it jumps from Zeus showing up as a swan straight to her laying a couple eggs and nothing in the middle. The next chapter is on Aphrodite. The first bit of this is laid out as a typed up fancy letter from the goddess of love to Zeus. In the letter, she addresses all the bad things that have happened to her or have been blamed on her that were really the result of poor upper management on Mount Olympus. She goes over the whole thing with Ares and how, I mean, it's kind of Zeus's fault because she didn't want to marry Hephaestus. And then the little mishap with Glaucus and his flesh-eating horses. And of course, the whole Adonis issue. And then the Golden Apple and the Trojan War. Just before she signs off, she alludes to the fact that she is going to end the war by whispering to Odysseus something about a horse. But I'm pretty sure a Athena is the one responsible for planting that idea in his head. After the letter, the Aphrodite chapter then moves on to a section called Wicked Women, and it goes over exactly what you think it would. It's a list of little myths where ladies don't necessarily do the best things. Some notable names on the list are, of course, Pandora, I know, the Harpies, and even Athena, who turned a girl into a spider. The third chapter is all about Orpheus and Eurydice, the two lovers who had a really rough go. This kicks off with a poem and some full page illustrations that very quickly and efficiently talk us through the entire story of what happened between him, her, and the underworld. I'll post the whole poem in a carousel so you guys can see how it actually goes, but I think it's better if I don't read it and you just imagine there's a British man reading it to you. When you do give it a little read, keep in mind that he says to pronounce Eurydice as you're a dice so that the rhyming makes more sense. But anyways, I don't want to give too much away, but very quickly. So Eurydice ended up in the underworld and Orpheus went down and talked Hades into letting his wife leave. But the god of the underworld gave him one rule. Don't look at her before you guys get back to earth. But he didn't listen, obvi, so she disappeared. Which totally sucks for the both of them. Then it goes on to some other things in ancient Greek life that were also pretty gruesome. Like how to make a liar, based on the Hermes method. Step one, find a tortoise. Kill it. Step two, get all the guts out of said dead tortoise. Step three, find an ox. Kill it as well, then skin it. Step four, Wrap the shell in the ox hide. Step five, add in the horns and tuning pegs. Step six, now find a sheep and kill it. Step seven, remove and clean the sheep's guts. Step eight, dry guts in the sun. Step nine, take seven strings of guts, then stretch them across the shell, then around the tuning pegs. Step 10, now pluck at the strings and play some sweet music. Some other rough things mentioned here are the punishments, sacrifices, childbirth, hunting, slavery, and similar parts of everyday ancient life. Next up is good old Perseus and Medusa. I would definitely love to use Perseus as a baby name, 
but I've also been alerted to the possible playground bullying that could arise from it, so it's probably out. This story is also spelled out within another letter, but here there's a little bit more handwritten charm. In the 10-page letter, Perseus is writing to his mother, letting her in on all the details of his trip to go get the Gorgon's head as a wedding gift for his mother and his not-so-welcome stepdad, King Polydectes. It follows his 87 or so day trip and goes through all the people and deities that he meets along the way, including his wife, the beautiful Andromeda. Of course, the story ends in a bit of a bloody mess, but don't they all? After his letter, Deere goes over the most notable killer creatures in Greek mythology, skipping Medusa because, well, we just went over her. The ones that are mentioned are put up on wanted posters. They even have a reward offered and some helpful tips for keeping your new pet. The compensation for catching one of these beasts isn't necessarily monetary, but some of the good ones are probably the python, which will provide its new owner with relief from salespeople and pushy Jehovah's Witnesses. Another chapter on the man vs. sort of beast is all about Theseus and the Minotaur. This is set as a couple of news articles detailing the heroic work of one young man, Theseus, who risked his neck to save the people of Athens from the cursed Minotaur. And then, of course, he gets a GF and accidentally ditches her before he drives his own father to kill himself by not changing the colors of his sails. But I mean, he forgot a whole girl too, so... Next up, we take a little departure from the myths and head towards some explaining of what's going on in the ancient Greek world. First thing to be introduced is a map of the mythological Greece, all the way from the top of Olympus down to the underworld and through all the different places souls might end up after they kick the bucket. Once the world is laid out, in comes the Olympians, and Zeus isn't added to the list because, as per usual, we've already talked about him so much. And the rest of the order of the list is odd too, but it's there. It goes Hephaestus, Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Ares, Aphrodite, Hermes, Hestia, Poseidon, and then Demeter. It's not alphabetical and it's not by alphas. I don't really know why they are in this order, but who knows anything. Things continue to go down a weird path as we move on to one of the more cruel twists of fate, the story of Oedipus. Anyone who tried to fight the fate of the oracles is doomed to, well, meet their fate. Another change of style, his story is told as a report by the Thebes Police Department, recounting the death of Queen Jocasta, aka Oedipus's mom slash wife, who hung herself when she found out about the whole mom thing. It takes things all the way back to the original prophecy that led to this terrible chain of events, Oedipus's travel and accidental murder over a little traffic incident, his heroic entry to Thebes, and then all the way up to where he gouges his eyes out. But, I mean, the deed was already done, so... Following the messy murders of that myth, the book effortlessly flows into other murders committed by the gods on those who wronged or disobeyed them, even with a little matching quiz where you have to line up the killer with the victim and the MO. Fun! Moving on, we now make our way to the 10 labors of Hercules. He gets a little break here from the 12 that were originally assigned. These are all laid out as separate tasks required for the SATs, the Standard Attainment Tests, where Hercules has to write a little report about each labor he completes, and then his teacher, King Eurytheus, then leaves a little comment along with the grade the hero was able to attain. He got pretty average marks up until the final task where he got a perfect score. But I mean, he was able to bring the three-headed dog Cerberus back without using any weapons and also without killing him at all. Then of course, staying on topic, we move on to a couple of other notable heroes from the great Greek tales, highlighting their lineage and their career. Interestingly, Achilles and a couple other heroes are not a part of this list, but I think it's for the same reason Zeus wasn't listed among the other Olympians. We either have or are going to talk about them to some length longer than a single paragraph. And just like that, next up is Jason and his boatload of Argonauts. 
His story is also told in a series of letters, including Polaroids, between Jason's witchy wife, Medea, and an advice columnist, Angela, where she explains the whole adventure Jason went on to retrieve the Golden Fleece and what happened within their relationship. There is some beheading, but no child murder mentioned after her husband's desire for a newer model. So seeing that she did admit to her crimes, she did get some relationship advice, and a warrant for her arrest. So there was most likely a wanted poster. But even though we don't get to see hers, there is a collection of other famous felons, what their likely sentence will be and the reward for their arrest. Some of the bad guys like Sisyphus, King Midas, and Narcissus, who is wanted for breaking a promise and will be sentenced to fall in love with his own reflection. All of these bad guys, I mean, Narcissus is probably the least guilty, but still. Anyways, they actually were all caught and had to do some pretty hard time for their crimes. Now, the last section is a little bit out of order, but I won't nitpick. So first up is the Odyssey. This part is retold as another little poem. I'll put this one up too. But following the non-rhyming introduction, we make it to the part of the story where Odysseus has it out with the Cyclops Polyphemus, including when nobody drives a wooden tree trunk through his one good eye. Well, his only eye. And before we make it to the Trojan War, there is a quick little pit stop to a vocab lesson. There is a collection of English words we use every day, or almost every day, like panic, volcano, serial, lethal, hypnotize, syringe, siren, money, demon, and atlas and three possible origins for the word, and you're supposed to sniff out which one is the correct one. Finally, the grand finale of it all is a play about the Trojan War. It kicks off with a cast list and headshots of all the major players involved in this myth, including the chorus. Achilles is listed as the superhero with just one teeny weakness, and Patrocles is, you guessed it, his best mate. And one thing is that here, Paris is known as the kidnapper, not the Casanova that Orlando Bloom was. Not to anyone's surprise, the play stays pretty close to the story, even including the part where the Trojans have to watch Achilles drag Hector's body around behind his chariot. There's even a little bit of cheeky dialogue between Helen and Paris as he shoots the arrow that eventually takes down the mighty hero, even with it being such a terrible shot. Everything then ends off with the Trojans thinking they have won and are recipients of an amazing, towering equestrian gift, which of course is not the case. The sack of Troy is also left out, probably because of all the pillaging. With the last main myth being retold as a play, it's fitting that the last section is all about actual plays that were performed in ancient Greece. There's a very quick intro onto how plays came to being performed in front of townsfolk, and a little bit about some theatrical competitions. After that, it opens up into another quiz section, asking true or false to different eccentric facts about the original stage life. And then at the end, the book finishes off with a little half-page epilogue that sums up Greek mythology as a whole and kind of leaves everything with a cute little message for children, pushing them to learn more about the myths and keep them alive for another couple thousand years or so. It's actually pretty sweet. But yeah, so that's a sum up of this little book. It really helped to get me into mythology when I was little. So maybe if you want to introduce mythology to your kids, I think this is a pretty fun place to start. But there is violence and gore. So, I mean, it's totally up to you. Okay, so now moving on to the question contest to win the free Oh My Gods t-shirt. This week, the question is going to be pulled directly from the book, so if you have a copy, this one will be a piece of cake. I'm pulling from the last section of the book, the playtime section. So here it is. The actors in Greek plays would stage exciting fights and battles on the stage with lots of blood splashed around for special effect. True or false? So now, if you know the answer, you can head on over to ohmygods.ca slash contest and submit your correct answer and then add in your contact info and t-shirt size. And if you get picked, you can win a free t-shirt. Alrighty, well, yeah, so that's it for today. 
So just a reminder, there won't be an episode coming out on the 22nd or on the 29th, just because I'll be visiting my family and it takes like a lot of time to create these episodes from beginning to end. And I mean, I love every single step of it, but I don't think I'll have the time to do it when I'm visiting them. But after that, we'll be back on the air on July 6th and things will go right back to normal. And by back to normal, I sort of mean back to the introductions. So the next episodes I have planned out cover the rest of our bases. I just think that it's super helpful to have at least a lingering thought of who and what everybody is before you hear them mentioned in a myth. And even that tiny bit of background information helps you paint a better picture of what's going on in your mind. And I just think it helps bring the tales to life. So that's my reasoning behind going through all of these introductory introductions. But anyway, so that's the proposed plan for July 6th. We'll be going over some of the more mystical and interesting characters. They, of course, are the muses, oracles, and fates. I know some of them have been mentioned in passing as reference to their lineage, but now it's time to get into detail about these ladies and go through their specific role in ancient Greek mythology. The week after that is a complete list of the personified concepts mentioned in the myths. Here again, we have gone over some of them in great length, aka the primordials. And even though there were a lot of them mentioned before we got to the Olympians, there are even more of them to still introduce. They don't all hold major roles in myths, but they are present in one way or another. And I am also just super fascinated by the idea that abstract emotions and feelings are caused or enhanced by all these little deities. Following the personifications, we will go over all of the mythological creatures that pop up in these legends. This will probably be the longest of the introduction episodes, TBH. It's going to be pretty much everyone else who isn't a god or a mortal, but the mortals will join us later on. And then finally, at the end of the month, we will of course have another media episode. I definitely need to come up with a better name for them. The media episode sounds so corny. I promise I'll have some other name for them by the time I get to this episode. But anyways, until I think of something, the last episode of July will be about a couple of movies. Three, actually. I hope you've seen at least one of them, but it is the original Clash of the Titans from 1981, along with the modern remakes Clash and Wrath of the Titans from 2010 and 2012. I consciously saw the remakes first, but I'm pretty sure I was probably exposed to the original version as a kid. I just don't remember watching it. But anyways, somewhat similar to our first Troy episode, we're going to go over all three movies briefly, and then finally go over all the little things about the myth that they changed or smushed together to get their final hero movie storyline. So if you like what you heard, please feel free to follow, subscribe, rate, and all the rest. And if you're looking for info or deets, check out ohmygods.ca for the reading slash watching list, as well as the cheat sheet and the upcoming episodes. Thanks again for listening. Okay, bye. Bye.